During the 1950s, some of the most beautiful parts of England and Wales were designated national parks. They were the trophies of a bitter campaign fought by ordinary people who wanted access to outstanding areas of countryside previously denied them by landowners. Now the national parks are held in trust for future generations, protected for our pleasure and our recreation. But how secure are they? Mike Harding is president of the Ramblers Association. The fact that we've preserved these areas as national monuments, which is what they are, they're every bit as much a national monument as Stonehenge, as York Minster, as Canterbury, Canterbury Cathedral. They're the people's monuments, if you like, they're parks, and they're the last wide open spaces where people can walk. Our parks may seem safe and permanent, a fundamental part of our heritage. But a shadow is hanging over them. That was 27,000 tonnes of limestone about to be removed from the Yorkshire Dales National Park. There are five major limestone and three gritstone quarries in the Yorkshire Dales alone, between them removing about six million tonnes of stone a year. The stone is destined for a vast range of products and processes, from cement to cosmetics, from chemicals to water purification treatments, but mostly for roads. The quarries operate within planning regulations and environmental restrictions laid down by the National Park authorities. It's all legal, but the extraction of millions of tonnes of stone has still provoked a furious debate between conservationists and quarry companies, leaving the local community and visitors deeply divided. There's a lot of people working in limestone quarries around here, and uh, to, I know there's a lot of people who are trying to stop quarries, but uh, if, if they did close down, there'd be a lot of people out to work. The limestone quarries, I didn't seem to notice them years ago, but they seem to be getting bigger and bigger now and the noise from them, when you're coming particularly off Ingleborough, the noise from them is uh, just getting worse and worse. And particularly over the other side, I think that's a particularly nasty one, the one near Ingleton. Uh, it's visible for miles and miles from the famous caves, the White Scar Caves. It's uh, visible from all those places. And I think it's a real, a real mess that they're making of it. There's nothing new about quarries in the Dales, but they're growing, and the bigger they get, the bigger the chorus of opposition. What was once a local concern is now a multi-million pound industry run by multinational companies. There's no doubt there is a genuine demand for stone, but countryside lovers insist it doesn't have to come from our national parks, since there are other sources of supply. We've always had to have quarries, and quarrying's always gone on in the national parks. Um, but it was always on a very much smaller scale. Man has always quarried here, right from the earliest days. He built his houses out of the stones in the fields. He dragged them up and made his houses and his farms and his walls. It's always gone on. He's burnt lime for the land. But what you had then was a local need being met by small local quarries. What you've got here are massive multinationals coming into the park and blasting it apart. The money goes out of the park, the profit goes into the hands of shareholders. They don't provide a great deal of employment, they provide some, but not a great deal of employment. And the profits, like I say, go out and you've got quarrying on an unimaginable scale. You would not, for any profit under the sun, allow somebody to come blow up York Minster or Stonehenge or Canterbury Cathedral. We're standing by and watching them destroy a national monument here and nobody's doing very much about it at all. The objectors argue that because the limestone in national parks is chemically pure, it's a precious national resource which can be used for certain specialised purposes but not for making roads. Stone of a much lower grade found outside our parks can be used instead. But nevertheless, that's exactly where a significant percentage of pure stone from the Dales ends up as a foundation for the nation's roads, where quality counts less than quantity. They're taking out grade one industrial limestone, 
which is the way it was classified. It's about 98% pure, most of it, around here. This is great scar limestone. It was put down millions and millions of years ago. It contains great botanical specimens, great caving specimens. It's a marvellous area. And they're blasting it apart and taking it away, 40 tonne at a time, to throw in the roads. That is where it's going. Uh, that, that is not correct. Uh, something like a third of the production from Horton Quarry uh, goes up to uh, Tyneside, um, where it is used in the production of manganese and many other chemical processes. Uh, the remaining uh, limestone extracted uh, is used for roadstone and concrete aggregates. We don't. It is not commercially wise for the company to dispose of high purity limestone into markets that um, it is not best uh, used for. Well, we're digging holes in the dales because it's really minerals can only be worked where they occur naturally. We're working the grit stones at Ingleton because it is a scarce commodity. It's a very valuable commodity which is used for the top dressing of motorways and trunk roads and contributes to road safety. Protesters still feel so strongly they're now calling for the closure of all the quarries. But the argument isn't that simple. Quarrying means jobs. The closure of the quarry would have an enormous local impact. Um, we employ 27 people directly in, inside the quarry and we employ probably another 100 people in the haulage and distribution of the stone that we, that we send to our customers. Um, we're the largest employer in the, in, in the locality, so it, it would be quite a large impact. Most of the trade around here, you know, are people who actually work in the quarries are connected, you know, via running vehicles, wagons, or actually serving to them. So, um, the actual, you know, the actual quarry itself, you know, it, it keeps the whole area going. And there's quite a few around here, there's, there's this one behind us, and there's two further down the road. And uh, it's a, you know, a community that works around the quarry itself. Now, the big problem here is, is jobs, and I want to say this and put it on record once and for all, because people around here have actually abused me, I've been threatened, and people that I used to booze in the pubs with don't even talk to me anymore. And I want to put it on record that I have never said that we should close the quarries down overnight and throw people out of work. This is a very delicate, balanced economy around here. The employment isn't too bad at the moment, and I don't want to see this quarry shut and people just thrown out on the scrap heap. No. But what I say, we've got to phase it out and provide people with alternative employment while we're doing it. And it can be done. They're proving this in some of the peak board now. They're actually sort of helping little light industry to be established there. People self-employed. Now, what I'd like to see here is for this thing to be phased out and shut down. And that hole in the ground there, just landscape it a little bit, put some little light industrial buildings in it, and let local people take them over and run local industry. And the money would stay in the park. It wouldn't go out into the pockets of Tarmac or Tilken or Consolidated Goldfields or Arco or any other of these multinationals that are blowing this whole dale up, not just this little part here. You've got a place like the surface of the moon down there at Holworth Bridge. What I'd like to see is local people determining their own lives and doing it in a nice, small way within there and preserving this national park. Well, if all the quarries in the Dales were closed, I've heard it suggested that somehow people would find employment, for example, in tourism. Well, to my mind, that's <laughs> naive, but it's also an insult to the many people who've spent their working lives in this industry. Um, I can't imagine that a quarryman would take very kindly to being told that perhaps he's been um, <laughs> wasting his time for 20 years. He really ought to have been employed selling ice cream or perhaps sitting on top of Ingleborough with a tea churn. However, locals do admit there's a price to be paid for their jobs, and it's not just the occasional explosion. The stone has to be transported from the park. 80% takes to roads often unsuitable for heavy traffic. Mainly the heavy traffic, that's, that's the worst thing about it. All these, these roads weren't made for these sort of wagons, you know. The ARC is extremely concerned about environmental matters. Three years ago, we agreed with the National Park Committee a comprehensive scheme for working and landscaping this quarry, and we defined where the quarrying limits were going to be, and this then in turn enabled us to embark on a comprehensive programme of landscaping treatment around the perimeter of the quarry. The intention was that, uh, as far as possible, we would screen what was going on within the quarry from views outside, and this has been achieved by the creation of screening banks um, which have been profiled so far as possible to blend into the adjoining uh, countryside. Um, 
We've also hydro seeded large areas within the quarry which previously were fairly unsightly from former tipping. And lastly, but by no means least, we've planted something like 10,000 trees. Um, and the result of all this, we feel, is now is a quarry which is entirely acceptable in the National Park. What they're doing is uh, they're just trying to tart it up. When they've actually destroyed the landscape, they're going to put a few quick-growing trees around it, usually firs or something like that, that'll form a very quick cover and they claim you won't be able to see it. That scar is on this landscape forever. Another problem which quarries are sensitive about is dust. Gordon Jackson farms near Grassington in Wharfdale. I took over in 67. Uh, the quarry was quite a... Well, we didn't know we had a quarry. We knew there was a quarry, but we had no effects from it. From about 1970, they started increasing production by new machinery. Um, I think it was 72, 73, somewhere where they introdu introduced a, a rotary kiln, I think, in 73, and another, another, another one followed it shortly afterwards. And with this massive build-up then of uh, potential throughput, uh, the pollution really started to come. As the quarry expanded, production increased, and along with it, the burning of lime. Gordon Jackson began to have problems with his stock. His sheep became infertile and stopped gaining weight. Lime dust from the quarries proved the cause of the trouble, and after protracted legal proceedings, he won substantial damages. Now, lime burning and dust levels have decreased. With lime dust, I don't think we realise at the start, or anybody else realises, what pollution can do. Having now realised the problem, the major companies have attempted to control the dust levels. ARC at Ingleton are particularly aware of the dangers. We've um, endeavoured to, to keep the level of dust and the level of noise from our blasting operations down to a minimum. We've reduced our, our vibration impact on, on the local community by a fantastic margin because of the latest uh, blasting techniques that have, that have resulted from major companies spend an awful lot of time and uh, an awful lot of money in, in, in research into these things and uh, um, try to improve the, the conditions for the, for the workforce as well. Although the quarries do pay increasing attention to the environment, not least because they're required to do so, the workings themselves leave large holes in the landscape. Ironically, it's only when the quarries become so large that companies can conceal their operations within the quarry site itself which undoubtedly improves the visual impact. In Ribblesdale lies Horton Quarry. Ribblesdale, for my money, is about the most heavily quarried of all the Yorkshire Dales. If you look northwards to Ingleborough, there's a quarry up there that Arco own, and they've got permission to extend into the Great Scar limestone under Ingleborough. You've got a quarry here which is absolutely massive. It's probably one of the biggest faces in the park. Down there at Helwith Bridge, you've got two quarries. There's Redland and another Arco quarry. And then down at the bottom there, you've got Giggleswick quarry. So in a space of something like 6, 12, uh, 15 miles or so, you've got a massive amount of quarrying going on, and it's just blowing this area apart. We did, in fact, in developing uh, that planning application, involve the Yorkshire Dales National Park, um, both the committee and the, and the professional officers. We also involved the local community and the uh, county council uh, to assist us in developing a landscaping scheme. In fact, that uh, quarry has recently received further planning permission, and uh, there is a scheme uh, which, in fact, will leave a landscaped area with a natural looking rock face at the end of the at the end of the extraction period. Well we're just here for a walk in Hotwoody but uh, the quarry is absolutely disgusting. I mean, uh, we've just climbed up Penny Ghent and you can see the whole thing from Helworth Bridge right up to well where does it stop? Um, you think of Ribblesdale as sort of an unspoilt area but uh, it's clearly not is it? I mean it's being bulldozed away. You've got Arctics driving up and down over these sort of tiny roads and packed bridges and what have you. Uh, it's just a complete mess. Uh, it's uh, been industrial wasteland in a few years, I would imagine. In the last 10 years, it's altered immensely. The area is a designated national park and ought to be treated as such, and clearly you can't allow the development to continue on this scale without offer, uh, 
suffering a lot of environmental damage. This has always been a pretty grotty area. It's always looked vaguely like the surface of some sort of strange planet or that thing that Tolkien describes in his book, you know, The Mines of Moriah. Um, but it's got worse in the last few years. They've lost the skyline there now. I'd always believed that they weren't supposed to break through the skyline, but they've broken through down there, and most of the skyline's disappearing in that area. And over here, the houses are closed down now, just under the nibble, and they seem to be working through that wastage behind them too. Got two quarries here, just a couple of hundred yards apart. As far as I know, they've got planning permission for quite some time to come. They want a, a, an extension of this quarry over here, Arco, to extend it into a beautiful old wood which grows up just beyond there, and they're going to do that. They claim they're going to landscape it afterwards, but what they're destroying there is the relics of a medieval wood, which has been there, you know, for over a thousand years. And uh, it's definitely going to get worse, you know, unless we, you know, manage to change the, uh, the system in some way. Well, I feel pretty disgusted. I always used to feel that this area was about the most blighted area in this end of the Dales. And looking at it now, I mean, how could you possibly say this was, you know, doing anybody any good? You know, people are making money, ripping the landscape off. But you've got a beautiful valley, Ribblesdale, one of the most beautiful of all the Dales, and just being raped. I just feel, when I look at it, I feel sad and nauseated at the same time, and mad. Deep in Wharfdale lies the famous Kilmsey Crag, one of the most striking landscapes in the Dales. It's hard to believe a place of such beauty could be caught up in the debate, but in recent years, Kilmsey Crag has been at the center of an impassioned argument. Because only yards behind Kilmsey Crag lies Coolscar Quarry. In the early 80s, the quarry applied to extend its operations. The move was vehemently opposed and the Minister for the Environment called an inquiry. But while the inquiry dragged on without reaching a conclusion, the quarry was running out of reserves. When it became apparent that there was going to be no decision in time for, uh, by the time we'd run out of reserve, we notified the Secretary of State and we notified North Yorkshire County Council that we were running out of reserves and that we intended to enter into the area that we were applying for consent for on the 7th of January, I think, 1985. Uh, and this we duly did. The guy went on quarrying in Coolscar when the inquiry was going on and he went on and on blasting the rock away without planning permission. He was taking thousands of tons of stone out without planning permission. In 1949, the Minister of Town and Country Planning, John Silkin, had laid down guidelines which the inquiry should have followed. Now, there are some very clear principles laid down in what are called the Silkin tests, which are rules that are applied to quarrying in national parks, which say that quarrying or expansion of existing quarries shouldn't happen unless there's a national need for that material and there's no alternative source of supply. And those are the rules which must be applied, and sadly, they're not applied stringently enough. After a second inquiry, an 8.7-acre extension was eventually granted, though with stringent environmental controls. But for conservationists, the key issue remained the purity of the stone. According to Silkin, pure stone should only be used for specific purposes like chemical production. But the quarry companies maintain that low-quality stone is a byproduct of their operations and can thus be legitimately used for other purposes. Uh, the stone here is limestone. It is uh, a carboniferous limestone of the very highest purity. The major users in, in terms of volume are the building and construction industry, but latterly an increasingly important customer has become the chemical industry. In the case of Coolscar, the uh, limestone, the quality of the limestone is very high, high in purity terms. Uh, it can be used for chemical processes, but the uh, mining, the quarrying company were in fact using it for roadstone and various other uh, uh, things which it didn't need, they didn't need to use that high quality limestone. And we were concerned that uh, if you if you're going to just take limestone out like that, uh, you're really rather wasting a rather precious reserve. We feel that in national parks, the quality of the landscape and the contribution it makes to our quality of life should carry a premium. It doesn't at the moment.
The workings at Coolscar are hidden within the quarry, and from the dale the only sign of activity is the coming and going of lorries. But to conservationists a major point of principle had been lost. Fifty miles to the south of the Dales is the Peak District National Park. It's an area of contrasting landscapes, from the sheltered limestone valleys of the White Peak to the bleak moors of the Gritstone Dark Peak. It's our busiest national park, with more than 20 million day visits a year. As in the Yorkshire Dales, the beauty of the landscape is the result of the underlying stone. And once again, that means quarrying. Recently, the debate in the Peak District has centred on Topley Pike Quarry near Buxton, which applied for and lost planning permission to extend its workings. Our objections to the extension to the Topley Pike Quarry uh, were several, and the, the main one really was the effect, the damaging effect that it would have on that special part of the landscape, very much enjoyed by large numbers of walkers. Um, there were other objections from local people. The villages in King Sterndale, for example, would have been very badly affected by this extension had it been allowed, and they were very much on our side in opposing it. And the other major objection really was on the end use of the stone. It's very chemically pure limestone that we're talking about at Topley, um, but the company said it would purely be used for road aggregate, and there were plentiful other sources of supply for that sort of material. Need was not the major issue uh, within the application. Uh, the objective was to extend the quarry workings at its current rate of operation uh, from a certain seven years to something like 16 years uh, further life. All of that extension of working uh, to be linked to a superior uh, restoration scheme which was in fact a landscaped dale. If the quarry would uh, be developed in such a way that uh, it would extend from the existing workings in a southwesterly direction, um, in fact taking out then uh, the uh, natural rock uh, and creating a dale which people could enter on a gentle slope. The proposal for a new dale at Topley Pike was put up by Tarmac. Um, our view, and I think most, the views of most landscape lovers and lovers of the Peak National Park, was that we prefer God to make the scenery. Topley was a victory for the Peak Board, and a second came at Eldon Hill, ten miles away. Eldon Hill has long been controversial. In the 1950s, it was described as the greatest eyesore in the Peak, and it's grown considerably since then. Its application for an extension was rejected in February 1987. But the national parks remain under threat. The Central Electricity Generating Board now requires millions of tonnes of limestone to clean the sulphur emissions from its power stations and combat the acid rain crisis. Shortlisted to meet its massive needs was the ARC's quarry at Ribblehead. How would they have gone about quarrying the site? Ingleborough is a, is a very lofty peak. It would have been impossible to screen the operations on the top of Ingleborough. What we would do would be to screen the processing plant so that it was, uh, or its views were minimised from this, the adjoining roads. And we would intend to have very serious discussions with the uh, National Park to ensure that any work contemplated fitted harmoniously into the into National Park. Although the CEGB has decided not to take limestone from this site, the very fact that it was considered shows the precarious position of the countryside. The quarry company could, quite legally and at any time, start extraction on those vulnerable 60 acres. Their permission, like many others, was granted in the years prior to the park being set up. These are working parks in which farming and industry must go hand in hand with the preservation of natural beauty. But powerful commercial interests rarely conform with the original concept of national parks. It's an uneasy balance and the future of these protected areas cannot be taken for granted. You're looking at you know, the last remnants of open countryside that we've got. And if you turn it into a mess like this, 
what are we gonna turn around to future generations and say that we let it happen, that we let them destroy the landscape? What are children in the next 100 years gonna do when they come and look at this and it's all gone? All there is is a massive, huge hole in the landscape. If you cut a forest down, you can grow another forest there. It's possible to do that. Blow that up and it's gone forever. 